You're listening to Nakedly Examined Music, a podcast about songs and songwriters. My name is Mark Linsenmeyer. My guest for episode 119 is Chris A. Maxwell. He started in Arkansas, got signed to a major label with Gun Bunnies. You're right now hearing their song Stranded from 1990's Paw Paw Patch. He then moved to New York, was a member of Skeleton Key, another hip MTV exposed band. He then turned to work in TV, starting the production team Elegant 2, T-O-O, with Phil Hernandez, doing work for Amy Schumer, for Anthony Bourdain, Iggy Pop, the film Hot Fuzz, many, many other things. And only recently has he returned to his singer-songwriter roots with two solo albums. We're going to be talking mostly about his recent one, New Store Number 2 from 2020. We're going to discuss the title track and then most of what I know I learned from women. Then we'll look back to that work with Elegant 2, considering Mr. Excitement by They Might Be Giants with Doty and the Elegant 2 from the They Might Be Giants album Mink Car 2001. Also a little tune they did with St. Vincent called Bad Girls for the TV show Bob's Burgers. And finally, we'll look at that first solo album, Arkansas Summer from 2016, with the song Imaginary Man. For more information, please see maxwellsongs.com or elegant2.com. For more about this podcast, see nakedlyexaminedmusic.com or support us at patreon.com slash nakedlyexaminedmusic. So I will play a little of Stranded by Gun Bunnies from Paw Paw Patch 1990. Just to show your origin, but you had an unusual journey to get here. This was a major label thing. And I saw, I heard your album of demos by the same group that didn't make the, <laughs> which sounds great. Yeah. Even though those were never mixed, it was a, just a better record in terms of we were a better band and better songs and the recording was just represented us more. And then we have the going to New York, being in Skeleton Key, so a more collaborative project. Yeah, exactly. I went there with a solo deal. And then as soon as I landed there, it sort of just blew up in my face. And I was just sort of floundering around and stumbled into what was Skeleton Key, which was a kind of an amazing band to stumble into. And then we've got the sidetrack that we'll talk toward the end here. Not your sidetrack, your main career now as part of half of Elegance 2, doing things for films, things for TV. And then finally, you reemerge with something that has a style that sounds like it has descended from this original stuff with Gun Bunnies, two solo albums. So here's the second. Can you say a little bit where you're at with this one and New Store number two, the title track in particular, before we play it in full? The Gun Bunnies were a real band in that we were a bunch of young guys, just like, you know, most of us all lived in the same house together and we just traveled around in a cargo van. And But they were my songs for about 90% of it. You know, there was some contributions from the other guys. And especially uh, David Jukes is a really great songwriter and musician. But I, at that point, I was pretty much the songwriter. And then, yeah, I had this kind of like meandering career, partly just like, how do you stay in music and survive? And that's kind of it got me to where I am now. And then at this point, I kind of went back and started making these solo records. And and new store number two, I just got the vinyl today. Uh, literally, like about two hours ago, the, the boxes of vinyl showed up. And it's very satisfying to see what's been a few years of work on that finally um, show up at your doorstep. Anything about this title track in particular, briefly before we hear it, and then we'll talk more about it in detail. My grandfather on my mom's side is from Beirut, Lebanon, and I uh, came over in the 20s. And it's a little bit about him. It's a, a little bit about small town America and sort of the death of the small town America. That's basically what it's talking about. This little town that I grew up in and watching him as an immigrant be accepted and appreciated and then, and then eventually seeing things like Walmart kind of come in and just mow that little town over. Do, do, do. To a small Arkansas town K.J. Jamel Dug his roots into the ground And that town leans like a sunken ship In forgotten waters Where a Lebanese man Married the youngest of seven daughters do, do, do. And got drunk with pretty boy Floyd do, do, do. Loaded cannon in the Korean War They sharpened knives and Peddled Levi's Then old 
opened a general store Where Penny Jean lies on top of the mountain And the paper mill makes the whole town smell right Sammy races trains, driving the boys insane And this door number two gone But not forgotten So the, I guess the initial question just is, why this style for this story that, you know, you said he came over in the 20s. It's certainly not the 20s style. I guess this is, as you were just describing it, this sounds like kind of what was popular maybe when you were, you're not 60 years old. So, but I'm getting a definite like 1962 kind of vibe off of here. What was the thought in terms of this choice of palette for this song? If you kind of trace what I've done, I've done a lot of things. I, I won't claim I'm great at a lot of things, but I've certainly done a lot of things. And Skeleton Key was, for instance, is a pretty much a 180 degrees in the other direction, uh, a heavy, heavy rock band, and that was weird and noisy and sort of like just downtown New York insanity. But I've always sort of resonated with a post Beatles Americana kind of sound and. That's kind of probably where I live mostly. I mean, I experiment a lot, uh, and I try to not lean too heavily into the cliches of, of all that stuff. But that song, I was telling an American story, and the elements of doo-wop that are in that song, the elements of like pedal steel, Cindy Cash Dollar playing on it, the background vocals, some of these guys, they play with the Ramble Band, Levon's Band. I think even Amy's on that song as well, his uh, Levon's daughter. That story being told 
in that style just seemed right to me, uh, talking about a small town and this sort of Americana of approach. With this being a solo thing, did you have a unit that you practiced up with? Was this strictly a studio project, you know, layering it piece by piece? How, what was the process here of putting this together? I built a studio, and which is where I'm in right now, next to my house in Woodstock, New York, a little project studio. And this is just me in a room surrounded by people in this community that I live in. It's amazing the uh, amount of talent that's within like, a, you know, like 10 miles of me. And so, yeah, you know, I put the songs together and then if I need help, I call some amazing player like, you know, Jesse Murphy or Jeff Lipstein or Larry Grenadier, you know, Cindy Cash Dollar, Rachel Yamagata. There's so many people that I'm able to call on and and uh, get a little help with. It's a slow process. I My process is a little maddening. No one is screaming for the next Chris Maxwell records, which is that gives me the luxury of time to do it until I get it right. I really like the drumming on this. It's just so tasteful. And I, I couldn't even predict exactly when, was it going to be bump or was it going to be ba-bump? Like, it's not entirely uniform. It's just, you know, tasteful little bits. Was that after the fact, overdub, you've already got the song and you pull somebody in? Or is this carefully programmed or? Not carefully programmed. Aaron Johnston played drums on this. And if people aren't familiar with him, he was in a band called The Brazilian Girls. He plays with David Byrne. He gets called a lot, and he lives not too far. He plays with Jesse Murphy a lot. He plays bass on that song. I had had a rotator cuff surgery. I was out, but I had a demo of me playing this song, just the chords and a a scratch vocal. So I went to another friend's studio, since I really couldn't do much with my arm. And those guys are kind of amazing. You know, we talked through it, and we played through it a couple of times. And I told them what I wanted. Your mind won't go to hip hop when you hear, but there's elements of that groove, the way Aaron's playing. I wanted to move things away from that sort of Wilco, Neil Young kind of Americana sound and have the rhythm section be a little bit more grounded and modern, uh, especially the low end. Those guys just know how to do that. So if programming means like asking and requesting somebody to play something that sounds really cool and maybe throw a couple of references at them and then them walk out there and just basically do it. That's an example of where it may have taken me months to write the song and get it right. There are moments on the record like that where it's really just one take. Like those guys just walked out there and played it and we might have done two takes, but I did very little editing on those guys. The demo, was this on piano or on strumming acoustic or what was the structure they were building on? Piano, just literally, I'm a terrible piano player, so I just do a guitar player. So that little eighth note, dink, 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 that was the thing that started the song. Yeah, exactly. And I think that's it. I think that was, that, that's from the actual original ah. track. I think I kept that. Yeah, Marco Benevento plays piano on this. Maybe some of your listeners would know Marco. He's an amazing musician, and David Barron plays B3 organ on it, and a lot of great players on it. I was figuring with these other guys that you maybe gave them some overall direction in terms of, okay, swell here, fill here. But like for the most part, it's kind of got a overall vibe like the band or something like that, where, you know, you can just let talented people mush around and maybe fix them a little in the mix. Were you, as you described with the rhythm section, fairly hands off in what they were going to do here? Some of my material on this record requires a much more detailed arrangement in terms of parts. And a lot of times I dig deeply into the bass parts when that has to happen. Or if there's something very specific I want on a keyboard or something, I'll just play it. But on a song like New Store Number 2, David Barron did a lot of work in playing on uh, the Lumineers' last two records. He's just a, a great player. The same way with Aaron is true of David and also Marco. You just need to say, you almost don't need to even say anything more. Just they hear the song and you go, I want the piano part that goes on this song. In Nick Lowe's words, I like, his, I like this quote of, that Nick Lowe says to some of his musicians, just don't play anything specific, which maybe that's a little open to interpretation. But to me, it means it's not about the piano part and it's not about the organ. It's all about what I'm saying. And it's the singer and that's the song. 
those guys, it takes a great player to play a, an amazing part that supports that and just stays out of the way. And that's kind of what those guys do and, and do it so tastefully and just do the right thing at the right moment. I hadn't heard that particular formulation, but I really like that in terms of, you know, sometimes I'm working with a bass player and they'll add something like that's such a prominent melodic riff that is going on. I'm specifically thinking like why Bruce Thomas got kicked out of the attractions. <laughs> I just read his whole book because he just writes bass parts that become so essential to the song that it's just not even the same thing without them. But yeah, <laughs> Nicklo being the producer on those sessions <laughs> could not tell any of those guys not to play anything specific. <laughs> no, no. I mean, yeah, the attractions. That's kind of an amazing thing. I mean, my band, the companies, the band I was in, Skeltiki, those two bands uh, also... I love bands. I love when somebody might have written the song, but that song is almost, it's just not the same thing without that drummer's drum part and without that guitar player's guitar part. Those are cool things. REM was a band. I mean, there's so many bands like, you know, probably every great band is a collective sound of all those guys together. But when you're talking about a solo artist, somebody who's singing a song, I don't really want to hear an awesome guitar riff necessarily. I mean, maybe, maybe I do, but I mean, I don't want it to interfere with me listening to what the song is about. Well, let's talk about what the song is about. So you, you start this biographical thing, but then we get very quickly, that town leans like a sunken ship in forgotten waters. So you're already talking about that, you know, it's not just about him, but about this thing that he is entering. So the chorus here, is this the most important part of the sentimentality here, the nostalgia here, where Petty Jean lies in the top of the mountain... Well, it's a little bit just poetic license to not keep tapping the nail right on the head to make the point. And also the point being that it's not completely about my grandfather. It's also about this memory and this nostalgia that I have for this place. And Petty Jean Mountain, I mean, you'd have to be kind of from that area to kind of know any of this, but Petty Jean Mountain is near the town, and it's just a romantic nostalgic. My mom and my stepfather were married near Petty Jean's grave. That's a story unto itself. Petty Jean followed her lover from France. She had dressed as a boy to be able to get on the ship to follow him over. Anyway, these, it's a love story that ends when tragedy where she ends up either dying of a fever or dying by jumping off the mountain. I always heard she jumped off the mountain, but I don't think that's exactly right. But anyway, her grave is on the top of the mountain. It's like so many songs that I love. I think I might know what they're talking about, but the lines that maybe stick with me the most are the ones I don't totally understand. Those seem to have a lot of power sometimes to me. When I came across that moment while I was writing it, when I said, you know, Petty Jean Lau's on top of the mountain, it made sense to me that that's how I talk about this memory. So the Sammy races trains driving the boys insane. What's the reference there? My mom and my aunt are, were just these gorgeous, exotic, half Lebanese women in this little tiny town in Arkansas that they were just beautiful. And my aunt Sammy would take me driving in a car and, and there was a train that ran through town and, and she would just blast down the street in this Mustang and try to outrun the trains with me in the car with her. Okay. So yeah, you're really mixing up, you know, this Petty Jean, anybody from the area probably would know what you're talking about there. The paper mill thing, obviously completely clear. Like I get <laughs> that what tone you're trying to get at and then a completely personal reference and then new store number two, which I can kind of get from context, although why is it number two? He came to town, he opened a store. That's a product of his broken English. He never really got great at English, so he had a store. He started peddling. It was, I think it's, I, I say that in the song. He was peddling from a, from a horse and buggy in the beginning, but then he opened a store, and then when he opened, a, he closed that store, and he opened a, a new store. His first store was just called KJ Jamel, which is his name, and then he opened up a new store, and named it New Store Number Two. I mean, it doesn't actually make sense. It's like the Spinal Tap line uh, where they say that they're talking about a band called The Originals, and then they, there's a band called The New Originals. And that's what he called it. It made no sense, but I kind of find that funny. And about the chorus, too, for me, if you're not trying to follow the song necessarily in a linear way, it's to me like a, a photo album where you're showing people pictures and you're flipping pages and you're saying, here's Petty Jean's grave. Here's the paper mill. Here's my aunt running up and down the road, you know, racing trains. Where all this was happening, this was where my grandfather's store was. And I miss that town. I miss those places. And I miss 
the memory of of what all that meant to me. Well, and just to file in your uh, misheard lyrics category, I heard the, the Sammy racist trains as semi racist trains. <laughs> I wasn't sure what that was, but that was interesting. <laughs> Oh my God, you're the third person that has said that. <laughs> That's not a good thing when you're talking about a ar- song based in Arkansas. So, yeah, let's, let's dispel that myth right away. It's my Aunt Sammy. Let's just listen to a little bit of the bridge right here. Was it magic he mumbled? No one understood what he said. But with two fingers he lifted the table above his head With the drums gone, got a whole bunch of very sparkly (laughs) little things flying around. And he sort of comments on how that comes together. It's like we're entering a whole little different sonic space here, which of course you do with the bridge. Yeah, I love bridges. I mean, I think the favorite thing about if I was going to talk about the Beatles at all, I would say that, you know, Lennon was my probably my favorite writer, but it was McCartney that could write the bridges that were so kind of amazing to me. So I I always like to have fun with the bridges. That whole little moment there, one of the things I wanted the song to have was a little bit of a magical quality because memories are magical anyway in that facts are not really that important to memories often, at least for me. So much of this song is sort of pieced together from what I think happened or what I'd heard. And that moment there in the bridge to me was this magic realist moment where they always told me my grandfather could start chanting in Arabic and then he could lift heavy objects with two fingers. And one of them was this enormous oak dining table that he supposedly would lift up over his head chanting something in Arabic. I mean, I never saw that happen. If you're going to write a song, if you're going to tell a story, you should probably find the bits and pieces that sound the most incredible and wonderful. And that, to me, always was a part of my grandfather's mythology that I just loved. Well, it's an interesting move with the mood of the song. That The verses before that are kind of when it gets its darkest. You know, they're all dead. The crown from his head sits on the head of a jackal. Masters of mankind mark off. You're, you're talking about the death of the American dream, which that sounds like a very, like, third verse. Now we're really punching it. But no, we got this. Then let's have another big, just as nostalgic, nice chorus. And then this very dreamlike bridge, so it doesn't get negative again in the shade of tall forgotten trees. I mean, it's it's wistful, but there's no, our town has been destroyed. In fact, by talking about the the paper mill makes the whole town smell rotten, that's not a magical height that now modern time has reduced it for, like, it was, there's something rotten in it at the beginning. Like I said, it's like you're flipping around in a photo album book. The takeaway for the song, I didn't want the takeaway to be uh, negative and be a bummer. But I also, you know, I wanted to get that second verse and relay that that part of the message. But that is definitely not how I wanted to, like, go out on the song. And we're going to end like we started with the do 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 doos Yeah, to say a little about, we haven't talked about this massive vocals here. Again, did you kind of have it very planned out, or did you just get a bunch of people in in succession and, like, eh, just put some stuff over this and see? <laughs> no, I, I wrote all the parts and sang them all, and then I had some really great singers come in and cut the parts with me. I'm trying to remember the genesis of that whole doo-wop idea. At one point, I was going to make the song really doo-wop. I even did a bunch of research in trying to find doo-wop singers that were living in this area. And there are people that do that. But in the end, I think I just sort of thought maybe just a little bit of a brushstroke. It was all it needed and not get too caught up in trying to chase that down. Well, yeah, I could very easily hear... <laughs> doo-doo-wop, like people actually saying the word doo-wop in there. And that seems like it just would have been a little less tasteful than what you actually did. So, Yeah, I'm kind of guilty of oftentimes like going too far with the idea and then having to go back a little bit. I don't think I ever went too far. I think I just did the research and then I ended up just thinking, you know what, a little bit of this is going to go a long way. Let's stop for a minute for a sponsor break. If you're listening to this episode at the time it's released or during one of the many months following that, who knows, then there is a lot of stressful stuff going on and you may well be actually isolated, which is very bad for you and may exacerbate issues that you would be having normally that maybe you've been putting off dealing with. So I want to throw out an option, which is BetterHelp Online Counseling. BetterHelp lets you connect with a professional counselor. It's a safe, private online environment giving you help at your own pace, on your own time. 
These can be secure video or phone sessions, plus chat or text with a therapist. They're hooked up with over 3,000 U.S. licensed therapists across all the states with professional counselors specializing in many, many conditions, whether acute or recurring or just wanting to get out of your own way and get the most out of your life. And the service is available worldwide through desktop, mobile, web, Android, and iOS apps. You can get in touch with someone to start communicating in under 24 hours, though I should say it's not a crisis line. But it is secure, it's convenient, professional, affordable, with financial aid available for many who qualify. And Nakedly Examined Music listeners get 10% off your first month with discount code NEM. So maybe get started today. Go to BetterHelp.com slash NEM. You simply fill out a questionnaire to help them assess your needs and get matched with a counselor you'll love. That's BetterHelp.com slash NEM. Now let's get back to the interview. This whole album is just the tendency that you're talking about gives us some just starkly different moods. Like we're not going to play Walking Through the Water, one of the singles here, but that's just one that, you know, it's got this vaguely Miles Davis-esque horn part that just socks you right at the beginning. Let's turn to a completely different palette from either of those. Most of what I know I learned from Women, uh, another one of the singles. Do you want to say a little about that before we get into it? This definitely seems to have a more like Tom Waits palette or whatever he was drawing on from the past. <laughs> I could hear that for sure. I started this song, the lyrical idea I had written down kind of a long time ago, like a pre-Me Too movement idea that I just wanted to write a song about my grandmothers. And that's what the song for me is about. It doesn't really talk about that at all in the lyrics, so you would never know that. But for me, I was raised by pretty much by women. My mom and my father were divorced when I was really about a year old, and he split. And I grew up in this little town, Marlton, where... I just, uh, it was my mom and then the two grandmothers, both uh, my father and my mother's grandmothers were just huge influences as well as my aunt. So I had these women that were my kind of role models and the men, a lot of work needed to be done <laughs> for them. Those guys needed to do a lot of work on themselves before they could be called really great role models. So I, the, it was the women that I always felt closest to. Consumed by weeds You know that the snake 
So yeah, this down and dirty <laughs> says here, this is a something in praise of your grandmothers. <laughs> That's a fun combination. And we got right at the beginning here, again, just like the previous song, it's got 60s do up but the rhythm section itself is doing something that's definitely, you couldn't think that it actually came out in 1962. It's definitely modern. It's got a little, the hip hop here thing. Here, likewise, we've got, you could have done just a straight, loud drum kit, but we've got this very heavily, do you want to say a little about your, how you're getting this drum sound in the first place with all these little, these little strange noises? I was a big fan in the 90s of uh, all the stuff that Chad Blake and Mitchell Froom were doing and especially like the Latin Playboys stuff, that stuff to me was just sonically really interesting. And it's still, when you put that stuff on, it still sounds incredible. You know, Waits was doing that stuff too. Although I was, I think Michael Blair might've been the drummer, but Skeleton Key was a little bit of a descendant of all that stuff too, heavily influenced by that trashy sound. I've always liked that recording with people like Dave Sardi, you know, like running stuff through a baby monitor or distorting stuff the distortion was just you know drums always sound better when they're just like sound like they've just been run through a distortion box so i created that loop myself it's another song i'd struggled with quite a bit to get right i could not find the thing and i just recorded that very first drum loop and then i had bought a really crappy amp in an auction most people use it as a harmonica amp I just turned it up all the way and just slash and burned on it. And then slowly the energy of the song finally felt right. And I just felt like, okay, long as I don't fuck up the energy of this and start now actually putting musical elements on top of this, I'll have something that I'm going to end up liking. And it ended up working out. Well, I could totally hear a distorted harmonica on this song as well. But instead, we've got these nice horns. So when you're writing, you just go in and actually write the parts out to put in front of the horn players. Unless it's the solo, Chime, who plays with the Dap Kings and has his own thing on the Dap Tones label. Great saxophone fella and friend. I had the part written. I kind of feel like he kind of helped sculpt that a little bit. I think I probably ended up overriding the part, and then we ended up probably collaborating on the idea of the part. But it was pretty much written. Solo-wise, the guy's amazing. So a guy like that, you give him one or two takes, and you're probably good. That's probably what happened that day. So this main riff that the horns come in... When one of the instruments, so here it's the guitar it sustains a little longer in one of the ears. So you got, you know, a little bit of call and response going on just, you know, inside this... It gives it a very mechanical feeling, which, of course, fits very well with what you're doing with the drums. Any sort of evolution in that as it went in terms of how many guitars am I going to have? You know, there's lots of things you could do to make it more or less trashy and gimmicky. But this is, seems to have a nice balance. Yeah, it has to be have space and big holes in it for that gnarly thing to be effective. So that original guitar part I did was really the only kind of nasty thing that I ended up on, uh, that I did. And I think I played bass on this. And the bass part also was just like run through an amp and just distorted and heavy, but very sparse as a bass part, not not a lot going on. Well, what about this marimba? Is that keyboard, you know, single note thing? Is that also you pecking out the transitions in the choruses? That's a pretty dense track. I think that that might be Zach Janikian playing piano, which he was out there singing on the track. And I think he ended up turning around during the song and just started banging on the piano. And I think that's how that ended up on there. There also might be a sound coming through. There's no marimba on it, so I'm trying to figure out what it might be. Well, let me actually just play a little bit. You got this little like synth part that's like the little bouncing ball that's getting you from section to section. Good ear on that. I always worried that wasn't going to actually come through. No, that's the piano that Zach just threw in. That's, I guess, why I was thinking xylophone and marimba, because that also kind of fits in this, what I was referring to. I'm trying to think of the particular Tom Waits song. Like some of them get heavier or lighter. Yeah, swordfish trombones or one of those like bone machine. The bone imagery. that It's like the skeleton playing his ribs kind of xylophone. <laughs> right. I think he got that from uh, Beefheart, too, like that weird marimba-sounding stuff. 
if I had thought about it, like if you'd been hanging out when I was doing it and you brought up marimba, I would have probably gotten very excited and went and found a marimba because now I'm thinking like, damn, I should have put a marimba on that. <laughs> it's probably all this Zydeco. I don't know the historical roots. This is what I should, I shouldn't just be saying that it only goes back to Tom Waits because of course it's this just general Mardi Gras kind of. Yeah, like African thumb piano stuff or marimba, I mean, uh, imbira or whatever, a kalimba. Yeah, it's a raw sound. That kind of raw and angular sound is cool. It probably sounds that way because I have a really terrible piano. We probably didn't mic it very well, so it ended up sounding like a messed up marimba. Can you say something about the tone of the lyrics here also? That we've got set a fire, wonder why the temperatures rise. You've got, I'm trying to think what genre you're kind of hinting at. You know, just the fact that you're talking about God and the snake, it's kind of, I guess, this sort of gospel. Again, kind of Southern, it's mama, the Southern flavor here, you know, over and above, obviously, your origin and things, but just that you're trying to connote a certain historical period or something with this through not only this choice of instruments, but what words? Yeah, the language of it. I like that kind of Cormac McCarthy. I love when people use biblical sort of words to connote like apocalyptic stuff. It's like the Tarantino movie, you know, uh, when Travolta and... Uh, Samuel L. Jackson, yeah. Samuel L. Jackson, right, exactly. Reading something from Revelations before, you know, blowing everybody away in the room. I just, I was thinking about my grandmother and thinking about this, the fact that I was, I had been sort of raised by these women and I always find myself kind of rooting for the woman's solution, or I shouldn't say woman so much as I should say maybe feminine, because I don't, not necessarily saying it's a feminine masculine thing, but the song itself is really, a guy wakes up, the world is on fire, there's a, an apocalypse is coming, and the singer is just asking the feminine nature of, that exists, like, you know, mother nature, how do we right the ship? How do we fix this? And using all the biblical imagery felt has weight to it in a way that just talking about these things otherwise, you know, it would probably sound clinical or academic. But when you start bringing in the woman of the apocalypse, which I don't actually say the woman of the apocalypse, but that's a figure from Revelations that sort of was in my mind as I was writing the bridge, this woman battling with this snake. It just felt right. It's not purely that flavor either. I just said, man set a fire. I wonder why the temperature's rising. Well, the rhyme for that is, can you tell me what we've lost through compromising? Which is hardly like something you're going to find in a country song from the 60s. My instinct when I'm suggesting what songs we cover here is, well, let's do one song from the current thing, then we'll go back an album or two, and then we'll go back farther. But there's so much variety on this current album that it's obvious that this was a few years of work, that this was not just, you know, you sat down and pumped out 10 songs that are all basically in the same vein. Let's move even further, because obviously with your work with The Elegant 2, with the, you know, you've got a crazy variety of styles, you know, a lot of them purely synth-based, unlike anything we've heard here. The song that you had suggested in terms of one of the collaborations was, I was very excited. I'm a They Might Be Giants fan that you've worked with them on quite a few tracks. And Mr. Excitement will play here in full that you're actually name checked at the beginning. So do you want to say just a few words about this before it plays? That was the beginnings of my writing partner in Elegant 2, Phil Hernandez. That was the very beginnings of us moving from like remixing and producing into TV stuff because They Might Be Giants had landed the Malcolm in the Middle show. So Flansburg was coming over and working with us at my studio working with Phil and I, and we were making cues for the show. We would bang out a bunch of cues. And I started playing this bass line and with this drum track, and Flansburg came back the next day and was just like, I think we're going to keep that for the, our Giants record, and that can't go on a, a Malcolm show. We're going to put it, we're actually going to make a song out of it. And so he wrote a song around it and then had Dodie come over from Soul Coffin and, and we all cut it and it was pretty cool. Let it be known, they might be giants. Dodie, the elegant too, Mr. Excitement.
being stingy on the pike collect the one into the other kareen in tandem the seat into the landum the people in the picks they want to snarf and dig the clam them I noticed I can provide a list to the listeners for the exact songs over the years that you did. This was 2001 from the Mink Car album. It seemed like whenever they were wanting to add a bunch of crazy techno stuff, then you guys swooped in and programmed. <laughs> yeah. And so how does that even work even with the two of you? Is it mostly Phil doing the computer programming, you doing the guitars, or is it just a complete mix? How does this partnership work? Phil's an incredible drummer, I and mean, Phil's an incredible musician and can play anything, but he, I mean, his first instrument is drums, and then sampling and using the MPC, and at that point, you, people used MPCs. I don't know if people use MPCs anymore, but sampling stations like that. We had come from live rock and roll backgrounds, where he played drums and I played guitar, but when we got together and started working together, it was the dawn of that home recording digital audio workstation. People were using Logic Audio or using Pro Tools at home. or It had always been too expensive before that, but now, starting in the 90s, like mid-90s or something, it started happening, and we got way into it. And so nobody was locked into an instrument. I mean, if it needed a guitar part, I'd probably do it. And if it needed drums, we, he would definitely play the drums on it. But it was more about what we could do sonically to like just completely fuck everything up and make everything sound crazy and like something you'd never heard before really and not a lot of people were not tons of people were doing it at that point so we had a little, a little bit of a jump on it and i mean people had definitely been doing the dust brothers and you know the beastie boys and years and years of of sampling technology from de la soul to cypress you know all of the hip-hop culture stuff but Using it as a fun thing to start interjecting into all different styles of music, we started doing that and got kind of known for it a little bit. And that's how we got started working with They Might Be Giants and the Blues Explosion and different people like that. It seems like it's a very nonlinear approach to drums in a certain way, that you're, you know, you're taking this, the basic beat and then, what, doing reverse reverbs or doing little extra things? Like, I'm just hearing in this Mr. Excitement track, there's so many places where 
okay, something trippy is happening <laughs> with, the, with the drums. It's not like the Learn From Women song where, okay, there's some processing applied, but it's still basically a linear thing that could be played. Those are fun days when that, you know, because that, that was still early in the technology of some of that stuff. You had the computer and you had the software and you weren't working inside of a dedicated machine like an MPC. You were starting to, but it's not as easy as it is now. Now with Ableton and things like that, you know, it would take hours to get there in, you know, late 90s, early 2000s with the technology we had, which like taking a drum part and cutting it up and messing with it and flipping it and using sort of just random techniques to produce uh, exciting, shocking results. Now those things are a little, a lot easier to, to access with the technology. But at, the, at that time, it was fun. It'd take a long time, but the effort was really rewarding. And we thought we'd throw in another very short, just two minute snippet of one of the elegant two things, this Bad Girls from Bob's Burgers featuring St. Vincent, which unlike Mr. Excitement, there's no frills on this at all. Like this is purely like a genre thing to tell the story. Do you want to say a little about, you know, how you would work in this kind of situation? Are they providing you the lyrics and the you know, what, what, what is your role here? That was the very early days of working with Bob's Burgers. We hadn't really started to do branch out too much. We were still just sort of scoring in the style that they wanted. But then it's somewhere along the way, this whole thing of uh, they started this thing, Bob's Buskers, which was going to be this whole like separate thing that would be on YouTube. They did a few of them. The National did one. Stephen Merritt from Magnetic Fields, we did one with him. And the St. Vincent thing, I think, was the first one. And we just happened to have a connection to Annie. Yeah, you know, it's comedy. So comedy generally works better when, you know, you just hit the nail on the head. And that was like, song was Bad Girls. And we were just like, let's write a straight up sort of Ramones sounding track and have Annie come in and just go crazy on guitar and sing it. last thing we're going to introduce here is we wanted something from the first of the recent solo albums, Imaginary yeah, Man yeah. from Arkansas Summer 2016. That was sort of a beginnings for me to reconnect to the acoustic guitar. I had been working Elegant 2 for a long time, for years, you know, just trying to carve out a way of surviving with the only skill set that I had, which is creating music. So it's a terrifying world out there sometimes. And I was just like, how am I going to do this? And I did that with Elegant too. And we figured out how to, how to make a living. But around 2007, my son was born and I picked up this acoustic guitar at a store. I started writing these songs that took me back to that place where uh, that you had mentioned earlier that you made the association with the gun bunnies. 
where I'd kind of started as a songwriter and whatever you call it, Beatlesque Americana or whatever you want to call it, but it was just like this, it's kind of where I live. And that was one of the first songs that sort of fell out of me getting reacquainted with, you know, my songwriting. I guess I was surprised, you know, at first listening to some of the Gun Buddy stuff, it did sound like, okay, it's this Wilco kind of Americana stuff, but there's actually still a lot of jazz in some of those songs, even, you know, maybe that's because it was the 80s, you know, that wasn't uncool enough by the late 80s. You could still, you know, Joe Jackson or, you know, that kind of Steely Dan descendants. <laughs> we were in Arkansas, but we were definitely influenced by some of that, that style council, Aztec camera, some of that stuff, Roxy music. There was a lot of stuff that we were being influenced by. And so, and even the Elvis Costello stuff, I think early on, you know, he admits that he just avoided all the fancy chords, but he knew them. He knew how to play them, and he ended up uh, showing you that by, like, album three or four. He was starting to bring in the, the weird diminished chords and the minor sevenths and all that stuff. And I had studied jazz a little bit. I, my knowledge of, of jazz, just basically, it's not very deep. So, <laughs> but for as for a songwriter, I had a, it, it got me acquainted with some harmonic things that, that I wouldn't have figured out if I just stuck to, um, you know, rock. You got some back rack chords in here. And de definitely once you introduce horn arrangements and things, then like, you know, you're entering a different realm. Yeah. So it's a nice, yeah. nice to have that third dimension of. So it's, is that the kind of story that with, with Arkansas Summer, you were going back a little more to this Americana, but then now, with the new album that you're laying on top of that, so a lot of the stuff that you've gotten from your years of ranging and creating different soundscapes. I was talking to somebody at Diddy TV the other day, we were talking about Americana, how broad Americana is. To me, it's really about storytelling. So the musical landscape behind the story can really be whatever you want it to be. And it could still be Americana if you're an American and you're, you, know, you come from a place that you authentically kind of have that in you. It's more about the storytelling, the harmonic context you, that you put it in. I think you can go anywhere with it. And, you know, look at Randy Newman's songs. He's not limiting himself. He's writing incredible music underneath the stories that he's telling. That school means a lot to me, that n kind of Nielsen, McCartney, Newman world. Carol King, and now even now with Nick Lowe, you know, he, he, his arrangements are very simple, but... But harmonically, you know, it's, it's advanced. For me, it helps the story get told a little bit more in, a, in an exciting way. Well, and I really liked some of the movement throughout this song, Imaginary Man. Let's play it. Thanks so much for doing this. Thank you. I appreciate it. I made you up in all your noisy things Your clumsy mouth and your stuttering Include the feathers on your lazy wings Invented everything you ever told me Gave your hands so you could grip So you could pucker, I gave you lips So you could wiggle, I gave your hips Fingertips for you to mold me. What did you make of me? A bitter rind, a salty sea. Love letter left in the sand. From imaginary woman to imaginary man. You made me up. From a grainy tree An inside out suit So you can see the seams The leading man For your dramatic scenes And I invented schemes To stay alive
Thanks so much to Chris. You can hear more of his work at maxwellsongs.com, at elegant2.com, and if you look at the blog post corresponding to this at nakedlyexaminedmusic.com, I will link to, first, prior to the two solo albums, Elegant 2 released basically an album's worth of material that's really nice instrumental textures. That's a whole aspect of his writing that we did not get into here, I think. And also we mentioned the band he was in in the 90s, Skeleton Key, also really interesting, also really different than what we've heard here. Now, I should mention that in addition to Elegant 2, one of the other sources of anything techno you might hear on a They Might Be Giants album was Adam Schlesinger from Fountains of Wayne, one of our casualties of the virus, along with John Prine and Ellis Marsalis. And I think this is going to be a very sad ongoing list. My next guest will be Casey Clifford, a country slash folk singer with a lot of gospel overtones, a really good classically trained voice and a lot of psychological insight. So come back and listen to that. I hope you're all staying safe, maybe using... Time cooped up to catch up on podcasts or write your own music or do something creative. And I know I always urge folks to go to patreon.com slash nakedly examined music to support this podcast. That, of course, is an ongoing need, but I'll tell you a secret here, which is you can hear the ad-free feed without even paying me anything. Just go to that site. You don't have to listen to me. Read commercials, if that matters to you. And, of course, if you do have extra change jingling around in your pockets, many of the artists that we cover here are now completely unable to tour. So please show them the love, buy some of their work, take advantage of the fact that many of them are live streaming instead of touring, maybe playing for free or at least accessibly in a way that you would not otherwise have gotten to see them. So however you're dealing with things, keep on musicking. Until next time, this is Mark Linton Meyer signing off.